So this morning I have met uh, some of my friends from Mongolia, so I was a bit late. And so today, I wanted to tell you a bit about the, the teachings coming from Lamrim tradition. And as we discussed yesterday, uh, from the 7th century and 8th century, especially from 8th century onwards, when Shandarakshita came to Tibet from India, and Shandarakshita himself, who is a great uh, scholar from Nalanda University, and uh, who came to Tibet and uh, prevail and spread the untainted lineage of Nalanda tradition in Tibet. And after a few generations, one of the Tibetan emperor, Tibetan king, Turebachin, and uh, during his period, the Tibetan uh, the kingdom as a whole was disintegrated, and this also resulted in the degeneration of the Buddhist, uh, Buddhist teaching in Tibet. And uh, when Tibetan, the whole as a kingdom was scattered, uh, one part of Tibet called the Ngari, and a place called Toding or Toling. So there was a small kingdom called the Ngari kingdom, and. Uh, and at that kingdom, so they have a tradition of inv inviting uh, the Indian scholars from many generations and also invited Padmasambhava. And uh, sorry, the, the teachings in Tibet which has been degenerated after uh, the one who, which was first established by Padmasambhava and Shandarakshita. And at, at that time in Tibet, in the Ngai region at that time, so Nalanda University was a little bit going down and uh, Vikramashila Institute, the great learning center of Vikramashila was fostering uh, at that time. So that was the main seat of learning in India at that time. And uh, at that period, uh, one of the great masters, which is renowned uh, all over India and all over the learning center. So he was invited to Tibet in Ngari region. And in Tibet at that time, one of the greatest scholars present was uh, Lozawa Rinjin Sambu. He was a translator uh, from the Ngari region. And uh, uh, Adisha came to Tibet studying from the Ngari region. And uh, the king of Ngari also requested Adisha to give a teaching which will benefit the whole Tibet. And he composed the Lamb for the Path to Enlightenment. And we can find from the opening verses of the text that uh, may I request you, sorry, uh, requested my requested by my obedient disciple, Zhang Juvwe. So here I compose this text. And uh, so Zhang Juvwe continued the legacy of the kingdom by inviting Adisha and his elder brother, Lama Yishiwe, was uh, Lama Yishiwe passed away in the jail of a Nepali king. And uh, there is a saying by Dhamdhamba uh, that the great uh, teachings of the Buddha are actually a symbol or contains the three teachings of the basket. And these teachings, whoever listen or heart, will be of great benefit to all of them. And uh, the three uh, baskets of teachings, the so three collection of teachings, actually comprises of, in terms of the content, the three trainings. And uh, all the teachings uh, comprising of the subject pertaining to the three trainings uh, were prevailed and composed in one text. For example, if you take an example in the terms of Abhisamaya Alamkara by uh, Maitreya, uh, it is 
not meant for one single individual to practice from the beginning to till the end. However, the Lamrim teaching, the stages for path to enlightenment, so this series of the teachings are meant for a very individual person to study from the beginning level to the till one attains the highest attainment of enlightenment. So therefore, the Lamrim tradition becomes very uh, famous in Tibet, very prevalent in Tibet, and it was initiated by uh, Adisha in Tibet by the composing of the Lamb for the Path to Enlightenment. And within the, the text of, of the Devamkara's text of the Lamb for the Path of Enlightenment, from the content we can classify into the teachings pertaining to three scope uh, persons, the small scope, the middling scope, and the great uh, persons. And uh, for the small scope persons, those teachings pertaining to uh, merely the attainment of a higher rebirth uh, for the next uh, higher rebirth for the next and subsequent rebirths, having renounced from the sufferings pertaining to the this life, and uh, for the middle scope person, uh, the mere liberation from the suffering is being taught, and. Uh, as for the great person, the teachings pertaining to the great compassion and the bodhicitta and the six perfections. So these three set of teachings uh, pertaining to the uh, three persons were taught by Adisha in the Lamb for the Path to Enlightenment. And uh, so this, uh, the termino terminology of the three persons, three score persons, were also coined uh, during the time of Adisha. And, uh, even Lama Tsongkhapa's the Lamrim text, it also mentioned two uh, purpose or the two means of uh, attainment of uh, the rebirths, higher rebirths, and and also the, as the as a means of attaining the enlightenment and liberation. And uh, after the Adisha, uh, Adisha's arrival in Tibet. And there have been many other great uh, Tibetan uh, scholars from Nyingma traditions who have also uh, composed many other texts, as, uh, sim for example, uh, the mind at Ace and so on, uh, which are also very similar to Lamrim tradition. Then in Kajyu tradition, we have uh, Dabul Haji, uh, whose also texts uh, is very similar, and he started his texts from the Buddha nature. The, the seed within us to become uh, enlightened. So from starting from that text, so it is also very similar to the Lamjim tradition. Then in terms of the Sajja uh, sect of school, it also uh, taught about the path and the result, and also speaks about the three appearances and the three tantras. So the first ones were actually very similar to the Lamrim uh, teachings, but when it comes to the three tantras, so this is a, a bit uh, unique, uh, which is uh, pertaining to the practice pertaining to the highest yoga tantra. Then later, there is also the new Kadamba traditions uh, coming from uh, Lama Tsongkhapa, initiated by Lama Tsongkhapa. And, uh, and within the new Katamba traditions, as for the Tantra uh, practice, there is also the Tantra practice with the Guya Samaja as the main uh, practice. So this is also, this is came to be known as the new Katamba tradition. And there are also terms, uh, different ways to uh, teach, uh, depending upon one's direct and the indirect lineage and masters, and also due to the different deities, about 10 different uh, commentaries and so on. But other than that, uh, the main uh, the point of all these teachings are similar to the teachings pertaining to the three scope uh, persons. And uh, the teachings coming from the Lumrim pertaining to the three scope persons is mainly to uh, to revert uh, one's attachment towards uh, this life and for the next and subsequent lives. So where is my text?
<laughs> My text is not arrived here. <laughs> So in terms of the Lamrim text, as we discussed uh, yesterday, in Lamrim tradition, there is also a reference to six uh, Kadamba texts, and there is also a way to uh, teach the Lamrim based on the six Kadamba texts. And this is very relevant and helpful because it is actually based on great analysis and logic and reasoning. So all these presentations are actually based on logic and reasoning and deep analysis. Then there is another set of Lamrim, uh, the Kadamba teachings, such as Kadamba uh, Lamrim, which is mainly uh, in terms of one's uh, practice according to Lamrim. So when someone teaches the great uh, stages of the path to enlightenment by Lama Tsangkhaba, then uh, at the middling uh, person's uh, section about the Four Noble Truths, there is a section which states that since the four teaching on the Four Noble Truth is common to all the teachings pertaining to the higher vehicles and the lesser vehicles and to all the teachings, so therefore it is very important to first establish the Four Noble Truths very well. And when we lead the disciples, we have to also lead the disciples with a great understanding of the Four Noble Truths. So if one do not have a general, uh, very clear understanding of the Buddha's teaching, then one may not be able to lead the disciple from a student from the small, uh, from the path common to small uh, person. So this will be a part which is limited to less intelligent students. So in order to lead the small score person to the next level of the middling uh, score person, so therefore, in order to attain a deep aspiration for liberation, first one need to uh, stop or the one's uh, attachment to this life. So therefore, the teaching on the small score person came into being first. So therefore, there is a great uh, importance uh, in Lord Buddha's teaching on the Four Noble Truths for the first time in Varanasi among all his teachings. So therefore, whatever teaching that we give, it has to be relevant and something connected to the Four Noble Truths, the teaching on Four Noble Truths. And also, uh, when we start the teaching on the Four Noble Truths, and the guiding the uh, students, we have to also lead the student in the same way and also the same uh, process, the same stages is also coming from Abhisamaya Alamkara. Uh, first, uh, if, you even, if you think about the 10 uh, sets of the teaching coming from Abhisamaya Alamkara, the first, the Bodhicitta, then the next is the 10 different kinds of instructions. So we have the terminology called the Ten Instructions. The first, the instruction on the two truths, then the instructions on the triple gems and so on. And uh, there is also the line from Abhisamaya Alamkara that the, the Ten Instructions are as follows, that the instruction on two truths, the instruction on four noble truths, and the two truths and so on. So the first is uh, the instruction on the two truths, so the presentation on the two truths is given at the first of the older instruction. Then it is followed by the instruction on the going refuge to the three jewels. Sorry, after that it is the four noble truths. Then later uh, it comes the instruction on the three jewels. So this is actual the process and the uh, order where we have to uh, practice. So I used to say that when we study and uh, when we uh, give the teachings to uh, any of our students, we have to give the teaching based on the same order. And when it comes to uh, the instructions on not being attachment, 
uh, which is the fifth or the sixth instruction, then uh, we, we can lead it from uh, abandonment one's attachment to this and the next and the subsequent re, uh, rebirths. But first, of course, it has to be uh, led by the instruction on the two truths and the four noble truths. And having a clear understanding of about the two truths and the four noble truths, then one should be guided towards one's refuge to the triple, uh, triple gems. And there is also a uh, uh, this verse, so what, whatever is the Tibetan origination, and whoever have seen this is the truth of suffering and the subsequent uh, four, uh, four other noble truths. So this is coming from uh, Nagarjuna's wisdom text. So the way Lord Buddha presence is teaching is first to let the people have a good identification about what liberation is. So when someone identifies uh, first what is the liberation, then uh, naturally the people will get a great inspiration and encouragement within themselves to uh, study the text. And Otherwise, uh, sometimes when we uh, give the teaching, so we always uh, uh, we always generate fear in people by telling that if you do not do this, you will be reborn in the hell and the hungry ghosts and so on. And I think this is not the right way. And uh, this is something that we can see in some other uh, faith traditions where uh, they uh, prevail that if you uh, practice our religion and faith, you will be uh, led by the God and you will be one with the God. But if you do not uh, do accordingly to the God's instruction, so then you will be born in the hell. And so, so I think this is more uh, towards generating fear and which is not the right way of imparting a teaching. And uh, the Buddha's way of the guiding disciple is by showing the path to the students and giving them an inspiration and encouragement so that they can see the liberation for the first time. But here I'm not saying that Buddha's teaching is the best in the world. Whether it is an appropriate or not, it also depends on the disciples and the students' uh, mental dispositions. And if one set of teachings, if one tradition becomes very relevant to one's own practice, or which is suited to one's own need and the place, of course, so that's, uh, that set of teaching is very relevant to that person. So similarly, Buddha's teaching are very relevant for some students and some disciples, so of course that is very relevant. But if the student is not ripened enough to understand uh, or to consume uh, what is being taught by the Buddha's, uh, Buddha, then of course he may, she, or be more benefited by the teachings coming from other faiths. And even in Buddha's teaching, we have a certain sutras which presents the existence of Atma, the Self, the independent Self. And uh, in other uh, texts, there are uh, presentations where there is no Self. So Lord Buddha himself has drawn a distinction and has given different, uh, in literally, uh, contradictory teachings in order to the lead the students to a topic, uh, to a place or a situation where they are comfortable, where they can find their uh, comfort zone. So without uh, referring or without uh, uh, thinking about the mental needs of the students, one cannot teach independently. So therefore, I'm not. All, I'm always saying that Buddha's teaching may not be the best or the most suited for everyone in this world. But I wanted to make again here clear that Buddha's teaching, the Buddhism, is one of the faith traditions which has a very strong philosophical uh, background, and it is very deep and very extensive in terms of its presentation and philosophical tenets. And for someone, when we give the presentation and the pre presentation pertaining to the two truths and so on, so some people may find it 
too complicated and uh, they think that, oh, I cannot practice it anymore. So they might feel that just merely going for refuge to the, the God as a creator may be more suitable. And I think that is uh, uh, more appropriate for that person. And again, so Buddha's teaching is very uh, extensive in terms of the philosophical uh, background. And maybe I think that I can say uh, nowadays that uh, to have a conversation and a discussion with the modern scientists. So among the faith tradition, I think it is only the Buddhists. It is only the Buddhist scholars who can have uh, uh, the teachings coming from the Buddhism that can be discussed in openly with the modern scientists. Uh, in, within the Buddhists, of course, we have the uh, different traditions. And uh, the Pali traditions also, even though they speak a lot about the Four Noble Truths and so on, but it may be very difficult without having a good understanding of the teaching coming from the perfection of wisdom teacher, uh, vis perfection of wisdom teaching. And uh, even though one may be able to uh, eliminate the obscurations pertaining to the afflicted emotions that is common to the two, l two uh, lesser vehicles, so compared to the higher vehicles or the higher philosophical tenets. So the, those who claim to be our hearts from the lower schools are still not yet, have still not completely eliminated the afflicted emotions and those afflicted emotions may again arise in them at a later stage. So for personally for me, it has been about 30 years since I have interaction with the scientists and uh, I happen to meet some uh, Buddhist scholars uh, from uh, the Pali background. Of course, they are uh, Westerners or European and uh, who have ordained themselves under the uh, Theravada traditions and study in the uh, monasteries in Thailand and, and so on. And I think they were present <coughs> during sorry, uh, one of two uh, conferences, and uh, we have discussion about the interdependent uh, dependent origination and also about the psychology and the mind training and so on. And then I found that there is nothing or not much input that they can offer in those fields. <coughs> so therefore, I think that the Sanskrit tradition is very extensive in this field and which is also uh, very well going with uh, the science. And uh, nowadays many uh, scientists and the Western scholar says that, uh, they says that Buddhism is not a religion. So I do not know whether the term religion is very uh, the right the appropriate term for Tibetan term for Chu. So they say that Buddhism is a science for mind. I think there is some truth in it. So therefore the foundation of the teaching has to be started from the two truths, uh, then further to the Four Noble Truths, and so on. And I used to say that I have a friend from Kham region in Eastern Tibet, and I think he's an abbot uh, in one of uh, the monasteries, and uh, when the villagers came to see the abbot, so one day someone came to see the abbot at his uh, resident and uh, his attendant says that the abbot is not at house today and I have to see the abbot, the villager uh, says, and uh, the attendant uh, who was uh, uh, clever, I mean, then he says that the abbot went to frighten the villagers. <laughs> So whenever we give teaching, so if we uh, continue to generate fear in the villagers by saying that if you do not do that or this, then you will be reborn in the hell and so on. So this is what is meant by the attendant. But if you give the teaching or presentation on the Buddha's teaching uh, relating to the two truths and the four noble truths, then there is 
This is not about generating fear. So everyone has to practice or study uh, out of their own wish, but, but not by generating fear or being frightened. And I used to say that we are in the 21st century and we have to be a 21st century uh, practitioner. And uh, the main reason is that for the till the 20th century, if we look, look from the development and the education uh, point of view, so it has been a very early time for the progress of the education system and the industrial revolution in the world. So even for the Buddhist family, so they can be satisfied with saying that my family is a Buddhist, my parents are Buddhist, so I'm a Buddhist. So this is a faith pertaining to belonging to the less intelligent person. And now in this uh, 21st century, we have uh, reached at a peak a uh, point where the Industrial Revolution has reached at its highest level and of course it is even uh, developing uh, further. So even the practitioners and the students and everyone now has to be, has to follow a path which is uh, pertaining or which is relating to the, the higher intelligent uh, person. So in order to, which is, in order to investigate, first we need to have a doubt about whether that is a fact or not. So first, whatever the Buddha gives teaching or presentation, first uh, leave it for you a doubt. Then once you have a doubt for the certain presentation, so then, uh, then you will start the uh, investigation. So generally we have this order that first you have a strong wrong perception about something which is one-sided uh, uh, wrong perception. Then later that wrong one-sided wrong perception is being uh, led to the two-sided doubt, which is which is a doubt for the 50 person ambivalent. Then after that, generally due to the pro through the process of investigation and examination, then one will be drawn to the the assumptions, then to the valid cognitions. So therefore, so before doing an investigation, it is very important to uh, keep the matter for uh, withhold on uh, doubt. And we have uh, discussed that uh, yesterday also. And uh, as we discussed this morning uh, about the, how the lamrim is stored in Tibet. So the perfection of Wisdom Sutra is the root uh, sutra of the Lamrim text, the stages of the path to enlightenment. Therefore, whenever gi anyone gives a teaching on Lamrim, uh, we have to give the teaching based on the two truths and the four noble truths and with the sources coming from Avisamaya, Alamkara. So this is I used to tell everyone. And whenever I give the Lamrim presentations and teaching, I used to give it in this way. So this is something that I felt uh, I need to tell you about this. Uh, please turn to 133 verse, the sixth chapter. The end of the sixth chapter. Verse number 133. The patient... The patient's chapter. Oh, that day. Yes, so, so the chapter on patience, verse number 133. Why do I not see that my future attainment of Buddhahood, as well as glory, renown, and happiness in this very life, all come from pleasing sentient beings? To summarize, and uh, we are continues to uh, take subsequent rebirth in this life, in this cyclic existence. Even in this, the verse number 134 reads, while in cyclic existence, patient causes beauty, health, and renown. Because of this, I shall live for a very long time and win the extensive pleasures of the universal chakra kings. 
So this is very wonderful. So with this, we have to uh, draw inspiration within us and feel great and courage that uh, having taken the Bodhisattva vow, that I will really make a great effort. And uh, with those efforts, uh, it will be possible for us to improve and to elevate, it, our, elevate uh, our realizations to further. So if you uh, always stay a very low self-esteem or out of uh, fear, then it will not be possible to move further. So with these uh, verses, give us a really a great strength and inspiration. So next is the chapter on enthusiasm or joyous effort. Oh, yeah, ta. YouTube. Tao, Saba. Chinese, Tato, Saba, yeah, any? Tunga Tali, Saba. So for the patients, we have the patients uh, taking first uh, pa patients not harming other, then uh, taking into oneself the suffering, then also having a uh, conviction about the teaching. So these are the four classification of the patients. And the first, the classification of the patients is very well taught in the sixth chapter. Sorry, the second one. So when we were uh, reading about the first and the second uh, classification of the patients, then the joyous effort or enthusiasm uh, comes into being as a very important thing. So without, if you do not have the patients to study or to practice for anything, it is very, uh, it is not easy because the afflicted emotions will always come and hurt you and harm you. So they will always uh, bring a lot of obstacles. So whenever these obstacles come, we have to be very uh, we have to be very uh, intelligent, we have to be very vigilant and make sure that we will face this challenge. So therefore, one of the best ways to face the challenge is by being, uh, making effort. And this chapter on the enthusiasm is also very uh, widely presented in Chandakritis, uh, supplement to the middle way. And uh, when we speak about the three eons accumulation, so this is also posi only possible for someone who can, who has great uh, sense of enthusiasm. So if they have such a strong encouragement and inspiration, so the number of the years doesn't matter to them. And we can also see the reference coming from the lower chapters and also from the precious garland by Nagarjuna, uh, where it says that if you have a great a problem or the worry within your heart, then it's even a small moment of a hardship may make a big obstacle for you. But if you do not have such things and if you have great enthusiasms and the willing to make effort, then even the thousands of the eons period will not make a big difference to you and you will find it very short. So therefore the first uh, verse reads, having patience I should develop enthusiasm and so on. So to make effort in the virtuous activities, so what are the obscurations pertaining to making effort? And we have discussed in the sixth chapter that to develop a good patience, we have to think about the negativities of anger. So similarly for the joyous effort, what are the obscurations for developing an, a good effort? So what are the obscurations? So main is the, the laziness that uh, uh, due to the different uh, works that come. Due to a lot of sense of distractions that we have, the sources of the distractions being engrossed in uh, different activities, which are non-virtuous at all. So due to this, we enter wasting all of the time. Then there is another uh, set of uh, the laziness or uh, a set which is always the mind is straying away from uh, one's main object or to listening to music or just watching movies and just passing one time. And uh, 
Uh, there's another center, which is, even though once, uh, this is a center of, uh, sense of a laziness, uh, that even though you are working very hard for your own living, for your own salary, for your own food, but you are working very hard for your whole life, mainly for your popularity, for your fame. So for all these worldly concerns, so you work very hard. So merely for this, it, for the realization of this purpose, you have wasted the real intelligence of your mind by engrossing on all negative activities. And the third set of laziness is a kind of low self-esteem or a self-discouragement, which is that I won't be able to do this, I won't be able to accomplish this. So you are always withdrawing yourself from the, even before you start that job. So in the verse number three, so the first set of laziness is being uh, explained because of attachment to the pleasurable taste of idleness, because of craving for sleep and so on. So from the beginning less of time uh, till now, we have been coming as a sentient being, uh, wishing to have happiness and not willing to go uh, suffering. But the fact is that the suffering comes without any interruptions, just like the waves of the water and river, and the happiness is not coming. So then what are the ways to stop this? So now you have, we have to give a re-introspection into our life, that how, why should I waste whole my life into engrossing myself to useless uh, this uh, sense of activities. So therefore, this is the time and this is the moment that I have to work hard to bring a change to my life. And there is also a presentation on the suffering pertaining to health uh, realms. Now move to the verse number 16. 16 sentences. What are the layer? Gilu meta, Pungzota. Without indulging in despondency, I shall gather the support and earnestly take control of myself. As we discussed before, in order to make effort, uh, one should not, one should be free of any uh, kinds of uh, laziness. Then again, here, a pride, a virtuous or a positive pride, and a negative pride is different. And uh, something, a uh, kind of encouragement, uh, the kind of the pride that we are discussing here is a kind of an encouragement for yourself, which is based on reason that you can achieve this. So first, one has to be uh, free of the the low self-esteem uh, laziness and uh, we all the accumulations uh, need to be assembled or we have to gather the supports and all the other factors and once we are used to the fact by uh, being so once we keep on uh, in terms of a skill for example so first when we start any kind of uh, skill box it's very difficult so there's so many things that you have to take into control for example if you think about the cockpit within in the cockpit for the pilots so if you look inside there's so many different switches so many uh, plugs so unless you are very uh, well accustomed to 
for, uh, unless you are very familiar to these things, you won't be able to operate it. So for the pilots, since they are very familiarized with this procedure, so as they sit on the cockpits, even though the fingers do not have any consciousness for themselves, but they move the switches correctly in a very swift manner. So this is speaking about the buoyancy of the body. So in this way, we have to make effort. <coughs> Sorry. Verse number 17. So how can we get rid of the low self-esteem, uh, the feeling, the sinking feeling within ourselves? So this is presented in the 17th verse. I should never indulge in despondency by entering such thought. I sh how shall I ever awaken? How the Tathagadas who speak what is true have uttered this truth. And the verse number 18 is also the same. And uh, in the Buddha's teaching, we can find a terminology called the Buddha's nature. And uh, about uh, the mental imprint or the seed to become the to become Buddha. So this is also presented in the Abhisamaya Alamkara by uh, Maitreya. And also we can find find the same uh, presentation from the Ansarpas Continuum text by uh, Maitreya. And we also have a reference to this as the one's own inner strength or the power to become enlightened. This, is also, this can be also explained from the terms of being a continuity that leads us to the, the state when we are enlightened. So, so this seat is something that we all have without the need to arise uh, in us by a factor. So it is, the power is within us innately from the beginningless of time. And we have discussed the same thing about yesterday and uh, day before yesterday about this the mental uh, this nature about which is by nature is an emptiness uh, which is the nature of the mind and the mind here actually we are referring to not the gross level or the coarse mind that we have as of now but a very subtle mind which is uh, uh, coming directly, teaching uh, per pertaining to the highest yoga tantra. And this, the very subtle mind, the nature of that mind, will be transformed into the Buddha and enlightened, one of the kayas, the aspects of the Buddha. And uh, when that mind is clear of all its advantageous and the other afflicted emotions, it also becomes enlightened in the form of the Buddhaskaya, which is free of all the advantageous. And the emptiness of that mind, which is the very nature of that subtle mind, as of now, will later become another form of the enlightened kayas, so which are the which is one of the four kayas or the enlightened aspects of Buddha. And uh, in the perfection of Wisdom Sutra, according to the perfection of Wisdom Sutra, they do not draw any distinction about the subtlety of the dead mind. So there is no distinction about whether the mind has to be a subtle or a coarse. But this distinction is coming directly from the highest Yoga Tantra. So the factor or the seed to be transformed later into one of the enlightened aspects of the Buddha is at this level a compounded factor, so which is the mind within us. So for any kind of sentient beings, of course we all have the mind or consciousness. And once we have the consciousness within us, the nature of the consciousness, the ultimate nature is merely a cognition. The, cap the potentiality to cognize something. And this is coming from the Dzogchen uh, tradition, the great uh, completion tradition, from Nyingma tradition. 
Sheva Tadalia, Dindu Numje with Sudo, and Donna Nyomonte, Sheva Tadala, Vesak Rishi Kavius. And in this tradition, it states very clearly that all the minds and consciousness have innately a capacity to cognize something, even for the afflicted emotions, which are also consciousness or mind. So they also have the innately capacity and the potential to cognize something. But so this is pertaining to the nature uh, potentiality or the seed to become enlightened. But the later part of the Buddha nature is different because it is being uh, fostered with the help of one's practice and one's realizations, and we progress it further. So even the small insects like the flies, they also have the potential to become enlightened. So the verse number 18 reads, if they develop the strength of their assertion, even those who are flies, mosquitoes, bees and insects will win the unsurpassable awakening which is so hard to find. So in the verse number 20 reads, but nevertheless, it frightens me to think, and so on. So in order to, to complete the accumulations, if you look at the life stories of the Buddha in his previous life, there are many uh, accounts where he has given of his uh, body and his limbs. But then you should not feel discouraged that I won't be able to do such uh, practice. So you should not feel discouraged. So line number three reads, without discriminating between what is heavy and what is light, I am reduced to fear through confusion. And once we have a brief or a gross understanding about the wisdom realizing emptiness and the skillful means, and especially when we are at the higher level of realization, at, this, at that moment, there won't be any difficulty for you to practice in such kind of generosity, even giving of your body and so on. And now due to the afflicted emotions by the influence of those, we have been, uh, we have been taking rebirth in the samsaric world for over and over again. But till now, so whatever the rebirth that I've taken in this world, is not by my own wish or will, but it is being driven by the afflicted emotions. But after that, from now onwards, I wanted to personally uh, uh, take rebirth in this cyclic existence world, existent world in order to benefit the sentient being. So this is a sense of great inspiration and encouragement. So verse number 22, so for the, in order to attain to enlightenment, so whatever uh, need to effort that I make and whatever hardships I may have to take, I'm ready to take that. So if you have such a strong a sense of encouragement, then maybe, may not in months, but in years, you will generally find a great a development, a mental development, spiritual development within you. And as we can see that with such a kind of practice, you will be more healthy and you will have a better calm mind. So by once engaging in the practice of the Bodhisattvas, you, we can find for the immediate period and for the long term also a great benefit for one and every. Every, everyone else. So therefore, with such a kind of motivation, if we practice in any activities of the perfection of this perfection of generosity and so on, so that will result in great heap of accumulations, and we will uh, accumulate great uh, uh, merits out of it. And this will be also the causes for our future of rebirths, higher rebirths. So this is verse number 22. Yet the suffering involved in my awakening will have a limit, 
and so on. So all these uh, unthinkable practices of the Bodhisattva that we cannot even fathom and we cannot even understand uh, and generate the inspiration that I can do that. But once you get familiar with it, so one, we will be able to follow in their step. So even we need to have a very strong, uh, firm, we, have, we need to have a very firm uh, confirmation within us that even for the sake of other beings, I will be ready to uh, take rebirth in any of the lower realms. Now turn to verse number 25. At the beginning, the guide of the world encourages the giving of such things as food. Later, when accustomed to this, one may progressively start to give away even one's flesh. So this is telling us about the order and the sequence of how we have to practice for our child when they are yet to have their teeth. So first we have to give them very light meals and later uh, gradually when the, when the teeth grows in them. So similarly, the level and the hardness of the meal also we will change. And first they develop on the mother's milk and uh, later uh, gradually they will change the mill to a more harder and so on. So similarly, taking this as a metaphor, first we have to practice in a very simple uh, path. And in this way, we, are, we also feel ourselves in, encouraged. And later, uh, when we become more uh, ready for more practice, then gradually we have to move on to higher practices. And uh, even from the Tantra perspective, uh, first, mentally we have to think about uh, giving our flesh, giving our body and so on, even though we may not be able to do it physically or practically, but mentally we have to uh, think about these practices. So later uh, it will be easier for us to engage in those practices. So verse number 26. So such a kind of practitioners uh, will not have any uh, negative uh, uh, will not have any negative negativities. The main thing is whatever the problems and negativities that happen to us is actually uh, due to the sense of the self-concern self within us. So when you have a, such a great sense of the concern for other, so automatically all the negativities cease by itself. So verse number 29, due to the strength of this awakening mind, the Bodhisattva consumes its previous evils. And the verse number 30, so having mounted the horse of an awakening mind, this dispels all discouragement and weariness. So next is from the verse number 31st onwards, it's about accumulating the factors needed for the accumulation of the merits. And for the for these uh, factors or the powers, we speak about the happiness and also joy and so on. So verse number 32. 32 sentence. Thus, in order to increase my enthusiasm, having a, I should strive to abandon its opposing forces. To amass the supports of aspiration, self confidence, and joy and rest, to practice in earnest and to become strong in self control. So, from the verse number 33, the, it's, the first thing is the factor pertaining to one's wish. I shall have to overcome the boundless faults of myself and others, and so on. And here when we speak about the power of one's uh, wish is that uh, at this moment I have assembled, there is uh, present in before me all the facilities pertaining 
uh, assisting oh, yeah. me to attain the enlightenment and so on. So therefore, I need to generate a very strong wish and enthusiasm within myself that I have to attain this enlightenment state. And the next uh, verses present about the result of the negativities and the fruits of the positive, so I do not have to go detail. So in whatever activities, the verse number 43, so whatever the activities, so whether it is the activities of the Bodhisattva or not, so we have to be very cautious before we plan for that activities or that task. If it is something that we can accomplish, then we have to perform it. And if it is something that you cannot accomplish, then one should not even uh, uh, do it that. So therefore, uh, first we have to be very analyze whether you can perform or accomplish it or not. If it is something that you cannot accomplish, so you should not uh, do it. Because otherwise you will later enter uh, feeling discouraged. But once you feel that you can accomplish, then you have to be very firm and uh, similar to as drilling a hole to the st uh, stone, hole into the stone, you have to make great effort until you have realized and accomplished it. And in order to uh, generate some pride, there it speaks about three uh, pride, about the pride pertaining to action and so on. Forty verse number forty-nine. Self-confidence should be applied to actions. And uh, the first one is about uh, a kind of a strong uh, affirmation that you will be able to perform it. It's not about that if, when someone does it, then you also follow that uh, people. But if there is no, not someone else doing it, then you do not want to also do it. So this is not about that. But you have to, you yourself have to take great a uh, strong uh, affirmation within you to go ahead and perform the text. And the verse number 50, the powerless, their minds are disturbed. People in this world are unable to benefit themselves. So otherwise, we are all always distracted by the worldly uh, activities in this world and we are wasting all our time for that but now since we are doing something that is benefit a very beneficial activities then I have to feel that of course for these beneficial activities I will work hard and make it accomplished and the verse number 55 I will conquer everything and nothing at all should shall conquer me so this is about the pride pertaining to emotions. And uh, this pride is speaking about the, uh, pertaining to that, taking a very firm stand, standpoint that I won't bow to the afflicted emotions. I, a son of the lion like conqueror, should remain self-confident in this way. Verse number 56. And if I go under the influence of uh, under the influence of the afflicted emotions, then this is not about the pride of emotions. So the pride of afflicted emotion here is, is actually someone a kind of a pride that can override the afflicted emotions. So therefore, someone who has all right the afflicted emotions will never bow to the enemy of afflicted emotion. So verse number 60, 
If I find myself amidst a crowd of disturbing conceptions, I shall endure them in a thousand ways. Like a lion among foxes, I will not be affected by this disturbing host. And I think next is about the, the pride pertaining to actions. Verse number 63. So all the practices of the Bodhisattva, so they are all carried out uh, in great joy and, inspiration and aspiration. And they attend to any kind of activities out of great eagerness. So 68, verse number 68, so the outline here is the actual way to take mindfulness. Just as in all various approaches, the source of an enemy upon the battlefront, so when you fight with the afflicted emotions, as we discussed before, and uh, you always con you consider the afflicted emotion as enemy, and you if you wait till the emotions arise within you, then it is too late. So first, when the signs uh, arises within you that the emotions are coming, going to come soon, then you have to take the countermeasure immediately. And we have to uh, walk in such a way that we go away from the factors that may give rise to the afflicted emotions. And as we discussed uh, yesterday, for example, the conceptual elaborations or the conceptual thoughts, negative thoughts, which is again rooted to the grasping of true existence of all the phenomena, give rise to the subsequent afflicted emotions. So therefore, we have to meditate on emptiness. And similarly, for example, as an antidote for anger, practice patience, and for the and for the anger, we have to uh, practice patience, and for the so generally, even at that moment, and merely by practicing emptiness at this level, we will not be able to eliminate the afflicted emotions completely. But even at this stage, so we may not have a very complete, a vivid understanding of the emptiness, but eventually a mere of assumption understanding about uh, emptiness will have a great effect in countering and uh, lowering one's afflicted emotion. So therefore, if we practice in this one, even though we may not be able to eliminate completely, but we will be able to hit the afflicted emotions in some way so that a certain damage can be done to the afflicted emotions. That is would be 67. So next is verse number 67. So this uh, our human body is actually related to our emotions and so on. So therefore, we cannot take a very austerity uh, measures and the practice. So therefore, we have to uh, approach a middle way uh, practice. So therefore, even if you study hard, if you re stay on retreat and uh, and meditate until you feel totally exhausted. So then this is not the right way. So therefore, one should not indulge in, engage in any kind of such activities, whether in terms of one's meditation or retreat or anything. First, stop it for a moment, pause for a moment, so that it will give, encourage you to continue later. But if you are too tired and completely exhausted, then later this won't encourage you to uh, continue your next session. And generally we say that for meditation, one should not end one's meditation out of a complete exhaustion or completely tiredness. So therefore, 
the next session will not be uh, able to continue. So you have to stop the meditation at the right time when you are not tired. So let's move to the verse number 75. In order to have strength for everything, I shall recall before undertaking any action. So for the positive actions, we have to work hard that both our physical and physical and mind are being able to work towards uh, the accomplishment of the positive things. So the here completes the chapter on enthusiasm. And next is the eighth chapter on concentration or meditation. Having developed enthusiasm in this way, I should place my mind in concentration. And uh, when we speak about the, in this chapter on concentration, it speaks about the single-pointed uh, mind. And as we discussed yesterday, even the non-Buddhist uh, practitioners also uh, generate a single-pointed uh, practice. And I've heard that even uh, there were ancient uh, Christian practitioners like Greek Orthodox also have this tradition of uh, meditation pertaining to single-pointed concentration. So meditation is something common to all. So the English term meditation, the Tibetan term gom. So in many countries, uh, we have this connotation about the term meditation uh, to stay in a very still uh, posture and uh, to elevate our mind from uh, arising of different emotions. And many people have this understanding, uh, this mistaken understanding about the meditation that just to stay in the still without thinking about much and without uh, not letting many thoughts arise in our mind. And I think that, of course, this suits for some uh, temporary purpose. For example, when you are in a very high, disturbed mind, this will give you some rest. But this will not bring much changes to one's mind. Therefore, so for the meditation, we normally speak about stabilization meditation or analytical meditation. Or we also speak about shamatha meditation, the calm abidance meditation, and vipassana or the special insight meditation, which is more towards uh, investigation. So there is also these two categories of the calm abidance and special meditation. meditation. And shamatha meditation is again more about stabilization meditation, while the special insight is analytic meditation. So therefore, the analytic meditation is more important because this gives the strength within our mind to check the reality of the things. And it gives the power and the strength within us to check the nature of the things. Even for myself, from speaking from my own uh, experience, I feel that the analytic meditation is more helpful, uh, especially to practice in terms of as an antidote towards the afflicted emotions. And uh, if you have to take a countermeasure against the afflicted emotions, the arising of those emotions, of course, the analytic meditation is more effective. But merely single-pointedly staying on something may not be that effective. So I wanted to tell again here about the shamatha meditation, the calm, abid calm abidance. And when we speak about the fo focus, of course, the focus are different, the analytic focus and the external focus, the inner focus and so on. So generally we see that we can start the meditation with the external uh, object, such as a flower or a, a stone or something. And uh, from the Tantra, uh, thinking about different syllables from our body, syllables pertaining to our head, neck, and the navel point, and also uh, thinking about the 
uh, the drops and so on. But uh, the shamatha meditation cannot be achieved merely by the sensory, so it's always pertaining to the uh, the mind. So therefore, whatever the aspect is appeared to the mind, so that aspect that is appeared to the mind has to be the actual focus of our meditation, not the object that is present outside. Even if you think about the flower, it is not the flower actually that is the focus of meditation, but the image of flower that is generated in your mind has to be the focus of the shamatha meditation. Then when your mind is calmly placed to that image, then the obscuration comes, which is the laxity and excitement, and excitement here is uh, pertaining to attachment, to straying our mind away, and uh, the laxity is a kind of a sinking, uh, sinking uh, feeling. Of course, there are different subtlety. So even if you are focused to your uh, up to your uh, object, but the clarity is missing. Then another obscuration is when you try to place your mind uh, single-pointedly, your mind keeps on straying uh, away from your main meditation. Even at the time of uh, meditation, if you think about the compassion or other things, this is also a kind of the excitement. So at the time of shamatha meditation, the main point is your mind has to be strictly focused, even without straying to positive things. So for the studying, first generate a compassion within within you. Then once the compassion is arising, then do not think about again about the arising of another compassion. So within that compassion, place your mind on that strictly. And then we also speaks about the meditation of the aspect of the object and aspect of the mind. So this is one category. And um, uh, meditating uh, similarly to the object or meditating as an object of attainment and so on. There are different uh, categories. So whatever the thing is, the aspect has to be, uh, we have to meditate on the aspect of that object. And the obscurations of the laxity and excitement is actually as I discuss, uh, described before, the excitement here is about uh, straying to the external things, wavering from one's own focus. So therefore, the mind itself has to be very focused to the object without wavering to anything. So if one is too tired, then we can rest at one place. Of course, the mind will not stray here and there, but this is not meditation. This will not uh, help. So even the mind, though the mind is uh, very focused at one, but the mind has to be very clear, and the clarity has to be at supreme level. I have one of my friends, a Dhamma friend from Ladakh in northern Tibet, northern India, sorry, and I know him for uh, many years, and I met him once. And he told me that he stayed in retreat for all three years. And when he come out of the retreat, when he start memorizing and when he uh, try to read something, then he says that my, I, my mind lacks its sharpness in understanding the text. And I think this is due to one mistake that he has done while meditating, which is that he was, the focus of his meditation was not very clear, and uh, the intensity or the clarity of the mind that is focused on the object was not there, and the sinking nature or the laxity was very much affluent, has influenced his own clarity of the object, so that may be the cause. So therefore, sometimes we may mistake the laxity as uh, the real meditation. So if the laxity uh, comes and if you continue to stay on that state, then there is a great chance that you will lose the sharpness of your intelligence. And this is even uh, found in the text. So the 
intelligence capacity of our human uh, body is one of the prime uh, treasure of us. So therefore, merely by sitting in a still point will not help. So therefore, we have to use the intelligence capability within us to make to grow it further. So what are the measures we have to take to uh, clear these two obscurations, to abandon these two uh, Obscuration. So how does the laxity come? So laxity comes when you are too uh, self-discouraged and when you are too high profile, when you are too excited, uh, then the excitement comes. So when you are too excited, so the distraction comes, then you stray away from your uh, focus. So therefore, when over excitement comes, you have to think, you have to redraw uh, your mind to the focus by thinking about, uh, for example, the impermanence. Then if you feel too low esteem or self-discouraged, at that time, you have to give some encouragement to your uh, mind and think about things, for example, the benefit of bodhicitta, or about the great human rebirth, how I am fortunate. So in this way, you will feel a sense of encouragement within you so that the laxity will go away. And sometimes the external climate or the weather will make a difference. And also the altitude of the place where you stay also make a difference and the light in your room will also make a difference. So therefore there are many external uh, conditions also. So therefore in the Dzogchen tradition, in the great completion of the Nyuma tradition, they also speak about such conditions. So therefore, the, the, level, the, the level at which you keep your mind will make a big difference to your meditation. And this is something to uh, come about by one's own experience, that you place your mind at certain level and you have to see that if the intensity of your mind is at a very good level, then you have to continue it. Then if it is sinking, then you have to find ways to encourage it. For the beginners, and uh, uh, it may not be easy to uh, have the image generated in your mind and uh, focus it. Therefore, uh, focus on your breathing, breathing in and breathing out. First, breathing out and then breathing in. So, merely focusing and placing your mind on the breathing in and out. So, this will help you to concentrate your mind. So this is a, a middle uh, level of meditation, which is a bit uh, subtle compared to the external strain, but a little bit coarser compared to the real meditation. So this will, uh, if you just focus your mental uh, placement, if you place your mental placement merely on the counting, the numbers of the uh, breathing in and out, for example, like 21 times and something, this will help us. Especially if you have a lot of, if you are under the strong influence of the afflicted emotions such as anger and attachment, so with this uh, kind of the counting of your breathing in and out will definitely help you to calm your mind a bit. Uh, from the Tantra, then the object of meditation, it speaks about uh, the drops and something, so this is a different matter. So what is the object of the Shamada meditation? So having uh, first uh, studying the meditation and later, the, uh, sorry, for the preliminary uh, practice, there are the nine mental placements of the continuously placement, closely placement, and pacify, completely pacify, patch-like manner, and so on. So there are nine mental placements. So in this way, you can place your mind about four hours continuously. 
without straying for even for a moment. So ultimately, you will realize or you will gain the pliancy or the serviceability of your mind and body, so which is called the attainment of shamatha. And I have some friends in America who can stay with focus on one object for all four hours. So I think that this is something possible. And what is the purpose of such meditation? So the fourth verse says that, having understood that disturbing conceptions are completely overcome by superior insight and doubt will come abiding. So the main uh, purpose of meditating on calm abiding meditation is not to gain higher concentrations of the desire or the form realms and so something, or not to enjoy the pleasures of the other realms. But it is meant for uh, realizing the special insight. And what are the factors that will favor the attainment of shamatha meditations? Uh, for example, uh, a favorable condition, a favorable place, and uh, there is the strong noise by the noise pollutions coming from the cars or the factories, and uh, also speaks about a great wind flowing or something. So we have to reside in a very calm place uh, where there is not huge uh, noise and also speak about very good land, and uh, very good water, and uh, good company. And upon that, and we have to stay at a place where there is uh, not much, uh, not much uh, chance for you to speak with other people. Uh, when I was in Spain, in Barcelona, there was one temple or a place, and when I arrived there, the organizers, there was one Catholic monk, and he wants to meet me. And I say, of course, I will, and I met him. And they told me that he stayed for over five years retreat on just the same place as a complete yogi and uh, abandoning everything. Only tea and bread, so other than that there is nothing uh, that he eat for all these five years. Then when I met him, and I told him that you have stayed for over five years in retreat with just a simple tea and in retreat, and I told him, what were you meditating? And he told me that he was meditating on compassion. And when he said that uh, he was meditating on compassion, the expression, his eye expression, the expression on his facial expression is very wonderful, it's very uh, not ordinary. And of course, Spain is a really a great developed country where there are a lot of facilities, but there were nothing in his meditating place. Then in Italy, there was a temple on the mountain, and I was invited there. And in that temple, there is no television and no transistor, even radios. They are not allowed to give even radios, let go of the television. So when someone enters that television, they have to live inside. Uh, they have to live for the whole life in the monastery. Even the cremations will be done in the monastery. So this is about having less works, having less uh, thing to do in life, a very simple life. And uh, I met a uh, Christian monk with a short, a stout body, a very uh, simple monk. And his English is also not so good. And my English is uh, kind of a broken, but my English seems to be a bit better than his. And I use my uh, English to converse, to have conversation with him, and I find him very encouraging. So generally, as we speak about less uh, things to do in life, 
and also obstructing all the external uh, conditions of the distractions and also obstructing the inner uh, conditions for arising the afflicted emotions. So this is the genuine practice. So uh, due to your own uh, uh, convenience, so if you, maybe if you are more comfortable, you can sit on chair. But generally, we speak about the seven postures of Virajana, that your feet, your hand, and your teeth, so that your, uh, your legs is actually have to be in the cross uh, vajra posture, that you, both your feet has to be put on the, uh, the left and the right thigh. So for me, it's not possible. And for your hand, it has to be in meditative postures with your, uh, with your uh, left one on the right and both the thumbs uh, meeting and also uh, about four inches from your navel point and your backbone has to be straight. So these three has to be straight. And your lips and the... Uh, a tongue has to be at their own place and uh, give your tongue to the upper jaw and uh, look at uh, your eyes has to be focused in front of you and uh, your shoulder has to be at ace and do not breathe very heavily or do not breathe very slowly just uh, breathe in a very normal way and uh, your breath uh, uh, has to be very normal. So this is about the seven postures of the Virichana. And also when we speak about the breathing, there are about nine different kinds of breathing, but we don't have to go detail. So what, uh, the object for the meditation can be anything. For From a Buddhist point of view, uh, if you place the object, if you consider the object as a small a statue of the Buddha will be great. It will also help you to have a recollection and generating faith towards Buddha. And of course, it will be a meritorious activity. So if it is a small Buddha statue, uh, a little distance from about w one meter uh, in front of you and the height about at the same level of your eye and the statue should not be very big only about one inch about thumb size and uh, the nature the detail of that uh, statue has to be also should not be a very detailed one so in this way and if you think that a uh, statue is very blazing, very light, lightning and shining, then it will help you not to sink or develop the anxiety and excitement. So, but you do not have to look at the statue, but focus or generate the image of the statue in your mind. And if you try to sit for a few minutes in a day, then later, if possible, uh, convert that few minutes into hours. And also you can change the uh, image uh, to different objects. Then also you can have the shamatha meditation for your own mind or consciousness because the consciousness do not have any color or shape. So first, consider the mind is mere uh, luminous and cognition. And uh, that mere the luminous and the cognition nature of the mind, merely on that aspect, focus your meditation. And I think the great uh, mudra also speaks about uh, meditation on the mind. And the, the great completion uh, tradition also speaks uh, almost similar, but these are all instruction coming from the highest yoga tantra. Then from the Guya Samanja uh, tradition, then we can think about the union of the bliss and uh, emptiness.
Then for the ordinary uh, persons like us who always spend our whole day uh, speaking about uh, emotions and so on and spending whole day in such a uh, non-virtuous way, then if you uh, live in a bit isolated way, then it will help a little bit by these meditations as we discuss about my Christian friend. And we have to uh, reside in a place which is a bit far from uh, the people and others who cause distraction to your meditation. And we have discussed that before also. So next is about the benefits of an isolated place. So 20, verse number 25, so from the verse number 25 onwards, it's about the benefits of the isolated prayers. <coughs> when shall I come to dwell in forests, amongst the deer, the birds and the trees, that say nothing unpleasant and are delightful to associate with? And next is about thinking about the negativities of being too attached to one's uh, physical, one's physic and also about being attached to one's belongings. And next about the desire uh, pertaining to the five uh, objects, especially for the desire realm and uh, about the lust. And with that uh, may result to the distraction and straying our mind from one's meditation. So with this desire and lust, we feel too attached to the uh, one's physics. As being a male, so we have to think the negativities of a female body. But from a female, we have to uh, think about the negativities of the male. So when Shandideva uh, taught this uh, text, so we have a tradition of doing uh, text before the, our 15-day confession ceremony for monks. So he did that, he composed that text, text and also he taught the text to the big shoes and all the monks. So of course for them, he has to present the negativities pertaining to the female body uh, from the perspective of meditation. But if we have to take this advice for women, then you have to think the same towards the male. Otherwise, uh, one of my friends says that he do not like Shandideva because Shandideva have a Shandideva criticize other people, but this is not uh, true. Uh, from uh, a male can think about the negativities of a female, but a female can also think about the negativities of the male in return. So this is the actual meaning of this text. Now, ninety-six. Verse number 96. 96. Sorry, verse number 98. 98 sentence. 98 sentence. No, 98. Remember, remember. 98. 99. It's verse number 99. Surely, whenever there is suffering, the what? sufferer it must protect himself from it. I think it's mistaken, sorry. It's 96. I Verse number 96. 96. What are they? Hmm. <laughs> Again, mistake. <laughs> Ninety-five. Uh, oh, now final, final. Ninety. Ninety. Please turn to verse number ninety. Nine zero. Uh, 
And this is about the meditating on the self, uh, equalizing and exchange of self and other. First of all, I should make an effort to meditate upon the equality between self and others. So this is with respect to the meditation of the self and other. So all the sentient beings on this world are equal in terms of wishing to have happiness and not willing to undergo suffering. And also the 7 billion human uh, family are same. So think about this. I should protect all beings as to myself because we are all equal in pleasure and not wanting uh, pain. So verse number 91, all the body limbs, uh, the hand, the leg are all different. But when we speak about my body, my body parts, so they all come together. So if someone, if, we, if an insect bite on your legs, so your hand will go and touch it. So similarly, for all the sentient beings, especially to the human, we have to have a consideration that we are all same as a human and uh, consider or think about the other's suffering as your own suffering and walk towards the benefit of other as much as possible. We are all same uh, from in terms of wishing to have happiness and not willing to have pain. But why is, is it that you have the uh, freedom or you have the right to uh, have the causes for happiness and not the others. So therefore, all the human family are the same. And I wanted to say that from my point, all are the same in that respect. So one, uh, you or the I is only one, but when it comes to others, so it's a rest of the human family or even the whole sentient being, so it's enormous. So to let go of a small thing for a big, bigger benefit, it is a wise decision. And it is the wrong decision to let go of a big benefit, a bigger benefit for a small uh, benefit. So therefore, if you compare the happiness of the whole sentient beings and uh, your own uh, happiness, so the other animal is uh, more important. But you and the other's happiness is not unrelated. Since we are a social animal, so we'll have to live in a society. The whole condition of the society, the nature of the society, will have a great impact to every individual, including you. So therefore, all are equal in terms of wishing to go suffering. Second, the one is uh, very limited, while the others are countless. And the third one is that you and the others' happiness are interdependent. So therefore, the fourth thing is, if you only think about yourself, then it will ultimately also bring loss to yourself. So verse number 92, the suffering that I experience does not cause any harm to others, but that suffering because of my conceiving of I, thereby it becomes unbearable. So we are all same human in this planet, on this planet, and uh, uh, if the general human family is in trouble or any problem, then of course the individuals will be affected. And the wise, sorry, the verse number 93, likewise the misery, the misery of others does not befall me. Nevertheless, by conceiving of I, their suffering becomes mine. Verse number 95, this is very powerful. When both myself and others are similar in that we wish to be happy, what is so special about me? Why do I strive for my happiness alone? Verse number 97, but why should I protect them if their suffering does not cause me any harm? If you think that if we need to have a immediate connection between you and the other, then what about 
the future. So the future suffering that may befall you may not have any impact at this moment. Then why should you have to avoid, even from now on, and take the countermeasure that the, your pain or the suffering in the future may not fall to you? Then there is another question here, verse number 104. Sentence 104. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 104. But since this compassion will bring me much misery, why should I exert myself to develop it? Should I contemplate the suffering of living creatures? How could the misery of compassion be more? And the verse number 105 and the remaining verses also speak about the same thing. If you practice compassion, of course you do not wish to have suffering. And the compassion is by nature, uh, is a wish to free other beings of suffering. Therefore, it may bring you more suffering. So since we do not wish to have suffering, so if you meditate on compassion, then your suffering may increase. So then we might have such a kind of feeling within uh, within us that if you keep on meditating on compassion, it will increase your own suffering. How could the misery of compassion be more? So this is the fourth line. So if you think about the infinite number of suffering, this is a reasonable, this is being proved by logic and also a virtuous action and uh, also an action that benefits to you now and also for the next and subsequent lives. So even at the temporary or the immediate period, it may generate a small uh, suffering, but you have to generate that mind. So your own suffering may push you down and you may have a feeling that you're completely uh, pulled over by that kind of sufferings. But when you think about other suffering and when you generate a wish to free that, you feel a pride within yourself, a kind of strength within yourself, a kind of a pride and energy within yourself, a strong commitment to free other people. So therefore, this is different. So if it is limited to your own suffering, then this, there is nothing that you can do about it. So therefore, in uh, pertaining to your own suffering, the tolerance will intolerance will be more compared to the other suffering. So if you think about other people's suffering, of course there will be a certain level of intolerance within you, but in the core of that feeling, there is a great sense of strength and encouragement. And uh, there are some people uh, who do not have good understanding about this skillful means and the compassion, and some even medical practitioners, and the nurse and those things, when they have a lot of their patients, then later they feel completely discouraged, and they feel so disturbed. And I was told about these uh, accounts, so I think that this is not understanding about the practice and about the pride and the inspiration that one generates in uh, helping others and trying to eliminate other people's suffering. So if you have these commitments very strong, then your encouragement of that kind of the mind even grow further. Next is verse number 107. That's because he loves to pacify the pains of others. He whose mind is attuned in this way would enter even the deepest hell, just as a wild goose plunges into a lotus pool. And the verse number 108. And uh, you are only one sentient being, 
and an individual. So when you take this inspiration and encouragement to benefit others, and this is also an uh, offering to all the Buddhas and Bodhisattva that they will be pleased and they will also, uh, it will also be a source of receiving the blessing from them. And all the sentient beings will be also pleased by your uh, activities for the immediate uh, you will be very happy, contented, and for the life, you will also have a very meaningful life, and also for the next life. And uh, within yourself, you will generate a very strong uh, kind of a special strength within you, and an encouragement. Then the verse number 109, Therefore, all the working for the benefit of others, and so on. Moving to the next verses. Raji, in this one, hundred and fourteen. Verse number hundred and fourteen. She the lava lava over. In the same way as the hands and so forth are regarded as limbs of the body, likewise why are embodied creatures not regarded as limbs of life? We consider the limbs of our body as a really a part of your body. So then why not the whole sentient beings are also the part of this family and same as you? So therefore we have to work for the benefit of all the sentient beings. Verse number 115, through acquaintance has the thought of I arisen towards this impersonal body, as the self appears to our mind, uh, it doesn't really exist in that way without dependence upon aggregates, and all our belongings, the things that we uh, it belong to us do not appear and exist in the same way it appears. And uh, when you consider the whole sentient beings as a real a factor or a very important cause for you to realize your own enlightenment, then you will be able to generate you will become very close to the whole sentient beings. And you can also say, these are all my family or something. So please turn to verse number 119. I should not turn away from what is difficult, for by the power of familiarity, I may be met unhappy even when someone whose name once frightened me is not around. And I can take my own example. I think about 40 years ago, I have great uh, aspiration for bodhicitta, but I have a feeling that I may not be able to attain it, I may not be able to practice accordingly to it. Then after that I studied the Chuenjuk text, then also studied the Lamrim text, and also read many sutras and so on. And gradually, when I get familiar, then I feel that if I really work hard, maybe I will be able to attain it. So I feel a certain closeness to the thought that I may be able to realize it. And this happened because of my familiarization. It won't happen momentarily or instantly like a flashing of light in the sky. I should not turn away from what is difficult. Verse number 119. So next is 120. Thus, whoever wishes to quickly afford uh, protection to both himself and other beings should practice that holy secret, the exchange of self for others. So this secret instruction is about uh, uh, exchange of self and other and giving and taking. So this is actually not recommended for the beginners or the less intelligent bodhisattvas. So therefore the terminology secret is given. And uh, the practice of giving and taking is also sometimes related to the tantra. So therefore uh, this terminology of secret instruction, the terminology secret is meant by that. Uh, 
Verse number 121. Because of attachment to my body, even a small object of fear frightens me. So it presents about the first, the negativities pertaining to our own physical body. And next is the actual uh, meditation about exchanging self and other. From 125, verse number 125. It presents about the faulty faults of the self-centered, self-concerned feeling and about the qualities of benefits of other concern. If I give this to other people, then I won't be able to use it. So therefore, you consider yourself more important. Such selfish thinking is the way of ghosts, similar to ghosts. Then if you say that if I enjoy this, what shall I have left to give? Such selfless thinking is the quality of the ghosts. Then if you indulge in uh, negativities such as killing, uh, telling lies, using harsh words, is all something that we cannot uh, inflict upon other. So if I indulge in any of these negative activities, I will be reborn to the hell realms. But for the benefit of other, if I offer my whole body, speech and mind as a means to benefit other people, then as a in, accordingly to the earlier uh, Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, I will be able to accomplish everything. Verse number 127, by holding myself in high esteem or considering yourself as most important and having a disregard for all the other people, I shall find myself in unpleasant realms, ugly and stupid. Even if you are reborn in a human, you may be reborn as an ignorant, a fool, or a deaf or a dumb, that people will criticize you. I shall acquire honors in the joyful realm. So next is verse number 128. If you consider other people uh, more important, as it is coming from the eight verses on the mind training, that whenever we go, so we have to always consider, whenever you met someone, you have to consider other as the supreme of the all. Sorry, you have to consider the other people from the core of your heart as being superior to you, compared to you. Verse number 128, if I employ others for my own purpose and also make them do a lot of things, I myself shall experience servitude. So in the next life, I may be reborn as a slave, as a servant, and people will uh, use me for their own purpose. But if I use myself for the sake of others, um, if I dedicate all my actions uh, for the other people's sake, and I consider that I am in the service of all the sentient beings, if you have such a mental uh, attitude, then I shall experience only lotuness. So to summarize all these things, whatever joy there is in this world, all comes from desiring others to be happy. So uh, when we speak about world, uh, from the bigger point of view, the relation between different countries, then also a relation in a small family or relatives or friends, all this depend upon uh, one's respect for each other. So if you consider uh, the other more important, and the next word says, what is there need to be said much more? The Chinese work for their own benefit. The Buddha works for the benefit of others. Just look at the difference between them. So look at the Buddha who is always dedicating all his time for the benefit of other people from the ins and ins of lives before. So and compared to the ordinary person, so who, compared to both of them, who is more happy now? 
who is happier now. So next is verse number 131. If I do not actually exchange my happiness for the suffering of others, I shall not attain the state of Buddhahood, and even in silo existence shall have no joy. Even if I reborn as an animal, if you always if you think about oneself, then you will be left without any friends. If you stay in the herd and uh, go with the herd and the friends, then you will also find company and get all the other sources. So verse number 132, let alone what is beyond this vault, because of my servants doing no work, and because of my masters giving me no pay, even the needs of this life will not be fulfilled. Next is verse number 134. So the self-concern uh, feeling is something that will uh, bring uh, permanent damage and destruction to oneself. Verse number 135, if I do not completely forsake it, I shall be unable to put an end to suffering. Just as I cannot avoid being burnt, I, if I do not cast aside for the fire, this is skipping to 138. For my own sake, I should not do anything with these eyes and so forth that I have left at the disposal of others. So from this onwards, as there is a special instruction coming from this text. And uh, oneself uh, giving on one side, which is the heap of all the self concern, to so mentally give uh, ourselves, the oneself, one, uh, on one side. And on the other side, you can give the group of all the suffering sentient beings and you yourself in the center and unbiased. So since you are unbiased and non-partition, and that, that single person, the individual who is filled with pride and boasting, then compared to all the other sentient beings who are suffering on the other side. So if someone is uh, unbiased, then of course he will go towards the larger number of beings who are suffering. Then he will stay with the group and uh, uh, help them instead of staying with that individual, indivi staying with that lonely individual. And this is very effective in one's own meditation. So sometimes if we uh, do such kind of uh, reflections, and if we uh, think that individual as yourself in front of you on one side, and those suffering sentient beings on the other side, and you consider yourself as another being, a third person, and meditate in that way, so it will be very beneficial. Oh yeah, Now, time for lunch. Time for Japanese rice. 